¿Cuánto aquí? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, am I visible and audible? Please give me a thumbs up, someone. Can you tell me, please, whether I am visible and audible both? Hello, can I tell, can you please tell me if I am visible and audible? Yes, thank you Bishal, thank you science and uh, yes, so now we begin with our lecture. So today what I've decided is I'm going to take up the light lesions in dermatology. So this, today is the lecture on light side of dermatology. Tomorrow we'll be taking up the dark side of dermatology. Okay, so basically it will be an image-based discussion on uh, the lighter colored lesions in dermatology. Okay, so to introduce myself, I am Dr. Resham Basani. I am your educator on the platform of an academy. Uh, I am practicing dermatologist at Matunga and I was associated with the KJ Somaya Hospital for 10 years. I left it in 2020. My core clinical interest is uh, pediatric dermatology and clinical dermatology and I like teaching and hence I am on an academy to continue teaching and uh, transmit the passion of clinical dermatology to all. So, uh, before I start, uh, I'll give you a small introduction about the upcoming iconic subscription. I think it is one of the best platforms because you have an academy and prep ladder on both uh, the contents of both on one platform. So from an academy, you have live classes and batch courses where you can chat with your educator, engage in discussions, ask doubts and participate in polls all in a live class. While uh, from the prep ladder, you can have video lectures as well as a question bank. Uh, on an academy, you have live tests and quizzes. As well as on prep ladder, you have rapid revision courses and a lot more. So the when you combine, you have a combo pack. So the pricing also goes down. So you can subscribe for the iconic uh, subscription. For 12 months, it would cost you around 4,125 a month. For 18 months, it would cost you 3,300 a month. For 24 months, it would cost you around 2,888. And for 36 months, it will cost you a meager 2,300. Okay, so I think this is one of the very good options that one has. And uh, will definitely cover each and every aspect of your preparation for uh, NEET PG or for FMG. Okay, uh, then you have, if you just want to go in for a, an academy subscription, you have the plus subscription where you have live classes, live tests and quizzes, batch courses and a structured schedule. Uh, the costing would be somewhere around 4,500 for a month, 3,750 for three months, 3,375 per month for six months and 2063 for per month for a 12 month subscription 
so uh, whenever you do subscribe to either the iconic subscription or the plus subscription please do use my code that is drresham10 and get a 10% off so with that let's begin let's begin with an image based mcq i would want you to uh, participate actively so this is my first question to all of you a 12 year old boy from bihar he presents with a 6 month history of ill defined hypopigmented slightly atrophic macule on the face the most likely diagnosis is is it pityriasis alba is it indeterminate hansen's disease is it morphia or is it calcium deficiency anyone science forward bishal dam anyone would want to contribute would want to guess what is the answer see there are certain clues given in the mcq itself one the patient is coming from bihar second he is having these lesions which are not acute they are since 6 months secondly they have mentioned that the lesion is slightly atrophic okay so the most likely diagnosis in this case is anyone yes satvik you are right the answer is indeterminate leprosy now why is it not pityriasis alba it is not pityriasis alba because they have not mentioned anything about scaling pityriasis alba would occur in an individual who is atopic by atopic i mean that the patient is more prone to develop cough colds has allergies or has history of asthma okay they have not mentioned anything about scaling they have not mentioned anything about atopy so the diagnosis here is unlikely to be pityriasis alba correct so uh, remember pityriasis alba will present itself as an ill defined hypopigmented minimally scaly patch on the face okay and they have specifically mentioned that the patient is from bihar okay for pityriasis alba the location doesn't matter right so patient is coming from bihar so that's an endemic area for uh, leprosy correct and very very importantly if you see they have specifically mentioned that the macule is slightly atrophic so atrophy is something which is going in favor of indeterminate hansen's disease you will not see atrophy in pityriasis alba what about morphia morphia is a kind of localized scleroderma okay so localized scleroderma would present itself as a hyperpigmented macule most of the times which is kind of hide bound okay which is kind of hide bound to the underlying dermis so uh, morphia because they have not mentioned anything about sclerosis since they have not mentioned anything about uh, uh the the hide boundness of the lesion so morphia is unlikely calcium deficiency it's a common misnomer that patients who have calcium deficiency develop hypopigmented macules on the face but it is it is a misconception there is no relation of calcium deficiency with any kind of uh, okay with any kind of uh, uh, hypopigmented lesions on the face so the correct answer here is indeterminate hansen's disease okay now so indeterminate hansen's disease let's elaborate on it now if you have exposure to the lepra bacillus okay then only 10% of the people are going to develop the disease okay now why is it called as indeterminate because the disease is yet to determine the response the body is yet to determine the response whether it's going to continue and develop into a more standard leprosy type or is it going to self resolute so since the disease has not determined the course as yet it is called as indeterminate hansen's disease so initially there is a solitary hypopigmented patch but please remember that the nerves are normal and the sensations are also completely normal on histopathology there is perineural lymphocytic infiltrate with or without very few bacilli okay why perineural because as you know that this mycobacterium leprae has a very specific affinity to the schwann cell 
okay so that is why you get a perineural lymphocytic infiltrate and you may not be able to diagnose it uh, you know you may not be able to uh, demonstrate the bacilli but still if you have a clinical picture and you get a perineural lymphocytic infiltrate that is enough for the diagnosis of indeterminate hansen's disease so the differential diagnosis in such a case especially when it occurs in a child you have the differential suspiciriasis alba which will be hypopigmented ill defined scaly with a background of atrophy of of uh, sorry atopy and uh, pityriasis versicolor it's a superficial fungal infection it would typically start off in the perifollicular location and then these lesions will coalesce so as to form patches which are associated with fine branny or furfuraceous scaling right so the correct answer here is indeterminate hansen's disease now let's go to the next question i would want active participation of all so here you have seven year old chandu who presents with recurrent scaly hypopigmented patch on the face so what is your diagnosis is it vitiligo is it indeterminate hansen's disease is it pityriasis alba or is it pityriasis rosea yes satvik you are right again very good the answer is pityriasis alba the reason being that they have mentioned that the patient is having recurrent lesions the the child is um, the child uh, i mean the patient is a child okay the lesions are scaly correct so all this goes more in favor of pityriasis alba it cannot be vitiligo see vitiligo is a depigmented lesion depigmented means it is completely white means it is uh it is milky white there is no color absolutely there right so vitiligo is unlikely indeterminate hansen's disease does not present with scaling okay and it can't be recurrent it can't come and go right so it cannot be indeterminate hansen's disease it can't be pityriasis rosea why because pityriasis rosea it's a viral infection which is caused by human vi herpes virus 6 or human herpes virus 7 okay so now this pityriasis rosea usually starts off as a herald patch which is also called as the mother patch and a few weeks later there are multiple daughter lesions which come up and they typically come up on the trunk in a christmas tree pattern okay so there is no presentation like a hypopigmented minimally scaly patch on the face right so the correct answer here is pityriasis alba and not pityriasis rosea remember the word pityriasis itself means scaly okay so when you are talking about pityriasis alba it's a scaly lesion okay is that clear please give me a thumbs up if you are understanding everything that i am saying so this is what pityriasis alba looks like ill defined hypopigmented minimally scaly patches on the face okay this is something very very typically seen in pityriasis alba okay and usually they may give you in the history itself that the patient is atopic so the patient has history of recurrent cough colds allergies parents have had asthma okay let's move ahead so here is your third question you have a patient who comes with oval to circular hypopigmented macules on the trunk he reports long standing fever a few years back his nerves are normal which statement is true will you do a woods lamp examination will you do a smear for jemsa stain will you do a koh mount or will you do a thyroid profile so the clues here are that patient is having as you can see in the picture there are multiple hypopigmented macules okay and he the, the main clue here that they have given to you is that he is reporting long standing fever a few years back and the nerves are completely normal now the fact that the nerves are normal and the patient has multiple hypopigmented macules on the trunk what will you think of it is not hansen's right otherwise the nerves would have got enlarged they have mentioned specifically that uh, there is long standing fever a few years back so anyone can uh, tell me on the chat what can be the diagnosis that we are looking at anyone so that would give us a clue as to what investigation we need to do whether we need to do a woods lamp or a smear for jemsa or a koh mount or a thyroid profile 
anyone no problem so what we are dealing with here is a patient who is having post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis the fact that the patient had fever long standing fever a few years back okay that is suggesting that he had visceral leishmaniasis that is kala azar and a few years after the onset of visceral leishmaniasis one develops post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis okay and for diagnosing post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis you need to do a smear for jeemsa stain okay so the correct answer here is smear for jeemsa stain okay uh you will not do a wood lamp where would you do a wood lamp you would do a wood lamp where you would suspect pteriasis versicolor okay but there is no mention of any kind of scaling so pteriasis versicolor is unlikely koh mount is also done to diagnose pteriasis versicolor again uh, pteriasis versicolor because of the lack of scaling it's unlikely and thyroid profile i mean there is no thyroid disorder would which would present with these kind of hypopigmented macules so the correct answer here is a smear for jeemsa stain okay so now let's uh, see uh, leishmaniasis let's have a quick revision of leishmaniasis leishmaniasis is transmitted by the fly uh, by the bite of a sand fly which is called as phlebotomus or ludzomaya okay there is a bite and the flagellate promastigote forms convert into the amastigote form in the humans so they have divided leishmaniasis into two one is old world leishmaniasis and one is new world leishmaniasis old world leishmaniasis is also called as baghdad boil oriental sore delhi sore aleppo boil kandahar sore or the lahore sore the main etiology is leishmania major and leishmania tropica and the vector is the sand fly or the phlebotomus so in the old world leishmaniasis you have initially a nodule or a plaque it then ulcerates and then it becomes crusted apple jelly nodules can be seen on dioscopy so what is dioscopy you take a clean glass slide and you press it on the nodule or the plaque and if you see the presence of yellowish colored uh, granulomas that is suggesting that it can be leishmaniasis remember apple jelly nodules are also seen in cases of lupus vulgaris as well as in sarcoidosis okay now please remember very important mcq here nodulo ulcerative morphology is characteristically compared to a volcano with a crater like ulcer and that's called as a volcano sign so remember volcano sign is what you would see in old world leishmaniasis or they may just give you the options as baghdad boil oriental sore delhi boil aleppo boil kandahar sore or the lahore sore new world leishmaniasis is called as the chiclero ulcer okay so the common etiology for this is leishmania complex and leishmania brasiliensis complex the vector is ludzomaya and the lesions are similar to old world leishmaniasis okay so this is what the volcano sign would look like it's a nodule initially which forms a crater and then gets covered with a crust so this is the volcano sign a crusted lesion remember when you have central crusting always think of leishmaniasis when you have central clearing always look uh, always think of tinea when you have central scarring always think of lupus vulgaris okay so this is central crusting right so this goes more in favor of leishmaniasis even here in this patient you can see that there is central crusting so this is leishmaniasis so to diagnose leishmaniasis what you do is a biopsy and the biopsy will show you extracellular and intracellular amastigotes which are called as ld bodies with right stain jeemsa stain and monoclonal antibody testing you can also do a slit skin smear uh you can also do a pcr but the gold standard for diagnosis is culture and culture needs to be done on the nicol novi macneil medium okay so please remember n n n medium nicol novi macneil medium is the gold standard for diagnosis for leishmaniasis so visceral leishmaniasis is nothing but kala azar and it's caused by leishmania donovani infantum and chagasi the patient has indulating fever leukopenia anemia splenomegaly 
okay and it's also called as black fever because it causes darkening of the skin due to melanin deposition that's why it's called as kala azar now a few years later that is one to two years later after recovery from visceral leishmaniasis patient starts developing hypopigmented lesions these lesions are very symmetrical on the body they are present uh, mainly on the face okay they are mainly involving the face especially the muzzle area of the face they are involving the arms and the upper part of the trunk later on these hypopigmented uh, lesions may kind of evolve into papular and nodular lesions so these hypopigmented lesions they very very closely resemble hansen's disease but how do you differentiate it from hansen's one is that the sensation over the patches is going to be completely normal second thing is that the nerves will not be involved okay of course you can do a biopsy you can do a sss and you can demonstrate that the lepra bacillus cannot be demonstrated while the patient will have those uh, uh, the ld bodies on biopsy so that will give you a conclusion uh, of the diagnosis detection of the organisms in the skin lesions may not be always possible because Uh, this particular condition is kind of a hypersensitivity phenomenon so it's kind of a post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis the parasite level is quite low so you can do a pcr which can detect the leishmania parasites the treatment of leishmaniasis see if you have a delhi boil or if you have a chikloro ulcer it can be self healing okay so uh, sometimes heating sometimes local curatage cryotherapy it can take care of the lesions if not then you can inject sodium steboglucosinate intralesionally okay so nowadays the drugs of choice for uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis is oral miltefosin so oral miltefosin is the current drug of choice for cutaneous leishmaniasis for visceral leishmaniasis the best efficacy is demonstrated with liposomal amphotericin b okay other drugs which can be used include oral miltefosin and pentavalent antimonials so this is what post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis looks like can you appreciate these uh, plaques on the forehead okay you can see the uh, muzzle area involvement you can see the involvement of the dorsum of the nose you can see the involvement of the chin and the rest of the body is showing multiple hypopigmented minimally elevated plaques and you can see there is involvement of the scrotal skin as well as of the penile shaft okay so this was about post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis now what you need to tell me, uh, now let's go to the next question you have a 24 year old male and this 24 year old male has multiple small hypopigmented macules on the upper chest and the back since the past 3 months the macules are circular arranged around the follicles and they have coalesced to form large sheets the surface shows fine scaling he had similar lesions 1 year ago that subsided with treatment the most appropriate investigation to confirm the diagnosis is is it a potassium hydroxide mount is it a slit skin smear is it a skin biopsy or a zanc smear i want all of you to participate can you please write down what do you think is the treat i mean is the investigation of choice in this case anyone yes aditya tk you are correct the correct answer here is the koh mount okay uh, so the condition that you are looking at is pityriasis versicolor now what are the clues given in this uh, mcq see they have mentioned that there are multiple small hypopigmented macules they are since 3 months the macules are circular and they have specifically mentioned that the macules are arranged around the hair follicles and many of them have coalesced to form large sheets and the surface is showing fine scaling okay so peri follicular uh, initial appearance of the macules which then coalesce and is associated with fine scaling is something very very commonly seen in pityriasis versicolor okay so the Uh, and as well as if you see the picture 
the picture is showing multiple hypopigmented perifollicular macules and as you can see it is kind of coalescing to form a sheet associated with fine scaling and in fact they have also mentioned that he had similar lesions one year ago that subsided with treatment and now he has a relapse okay so uh, it can't be hansen's disease right so it you can't, you i mean a slit skin smear is not going to help skin biopsy is too invasive to diagnose i mean that would be done if you are suspecting hansen's or leishmaniasis zang smear is done in vesiculobullous disorders wouldn't help here in this case anyway so the correct answer here is the potassium hydroxide mount so now let's revise uh, the pteriasis versicola remember as i told you pteriasis is meaning that it is scaly right so versicolor means it can be variously colored so it can be either hypopigmented it can be hyperpigmented it can be uh, reddish in color it can be uh, brownish in color okay it can be pink in color okay so pteriasis means scaly and versicolor means variously colored now this particular organism i mean sorry this particular condition is caused by the malassezia yeasts remember that the malassezia yeasts are normal inhabitants of the skin especially of the seboric areas now what happens is now you know that the hair follicle uh, the sebaceous gland it opens out into the hair follicle correct so when the sebaceous gland is opening out into the hair follicle the maximum uh, oil is going to be in the perifollicular location right so that is why you get and this particular organism the malassezia yeast it likes oil so it's going to proliferate in the perifollicular location and hence uh, when you start off with pteriasis versicolor the lesions are perifollicular in location and then they kind of coalesce together okay so as you know that these are normal inhabitants of the skin so why does this happen so this happens when there is a shift in the balance between the host and the normal flora which allows the proliferation the most common associated malassezia species is malassezia globosa while some of them have found uh, the malassezia sympodialis and furfur as the commonest organisms upper trunk is the most common site so this is what pteriasis rubra i'm sorry pteriasis uh, versicolor looks like the hypopigmented variant there are fine brani powdery scales itching is something unusual now one would ask why is there hypopigmentation in cases of pteriasis versicolor the hypopigmentation happens because of azelaic acid now this azelaic acid is secreted by the malassezia species and it inhibits the tyrosinase which is an important um, enzyme in the production of melanin so also it is said that this particular fungus causes direct cytotoxic effect on the melanocytes okay so these two are the reasons why you tend to get hypopigmentation in cases of pteriasis versicolor okay is this clear everyone with me please give me a thumbs up can we move ahead okay so let's move ahead okay this is a sign which is associated with pteriasis versicolor where you can make the fine brani scales of pteriasis versicolor more prominent okay and this sign is called as the scratch sign coupe de ongle sign nail sign or the besnier sign if you do a woods lamp examination of pteriasis versicolor you will find that there will be pale yellow fluorescence and this is happening because of pteriolactone and pteridin which is secreted by the fungus malassezia if you take a koh mount of this patient uh, you will have a typical spaghetti meatball appearance so the spaghetti are these round spores okay and the the spaghetti and sorry the meatballs are the round spores and the spaghetti are the hyphal elements so the other name for is it is the banana and grapes appearance okay remember that in cases of pteriasis versicolor malassezia fungal culture is not something very useful because the 
uh, organism is a normal part of the skin flora okay so a culture won't be very useful but definitely if you can demonstrate the spaghetti meatball appearance it will give you the diagnosis of pityriasis versicolor how do you treat pityriasis versicolor you can give the patient topical azoles you can give topical terpenafin you can give topical selenium sulfide uh, that is at the first line treatment for the second line treatment you can give the patient oral itraconazole fluconazole oral ketoconazole though is not preferred because oral ketoconazole causes uh, hepatotoxicity so this is not preferred but please 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 remember oral griseofulvin and oral terbenafin they do not work in pityriasis versicolor topical terbenafin will work but oral griseofulvin and terbenafin do not work in cases of pityriasis versicolor yeah so now let's move ahead with our next question you have a newborn child who presents with a solitary white well defined hypopigmented patch on his upper abdomen okay so tell me what will be the the diagnosis whether is it piebaldism is it albinism is it nevus acromicus or is it acral vitiligo yes aditya you are right ketoconazole is an enzyme inhibitor yeah but that's not the reason that we are not using it we are not using it because there is a higher chance of uh, hepatotoxicity in fact it is banned in a few countries now yes all of you are right the answer here is nevus acromicus and the other name for nevus acromicus is nevus depigmentosus so nevus depigmentosus presents itself as a single well defined hypopigmented patch which is present since birth please remember that nevus depigmentosus is a misnomer and so is nevus acromicus nevus depigmentosus is never completely depigmented in fact it is hypopigmented okay and it is present at birth uh, what actually happens is that uh, you know that the melanocytes they are going to uh, they are going to be uh, you know they travel from the neural crest and then they lodge themselves into the basal layer of the epidermis okay now what happens and then once they lodge themselves into the basal layer of the epidermis the melanocyte is going to have multiple dendrites okay now within the melanocyte there are going to be certain organelles which are called as melanosomes and these melanosomes they are going to produce melanin the melanin is going to get uh, produced within the melanosomes in the, the melanocytes and then it is transferred to the keratinocytes so one melanocyte is going to give the color or transmit the melanin to 36 other keratinocytes okay so this is called as the epidermal melanin unit now when there is a defect in the transfer of the melanos of the melanin from the melanocyte to the keratinocyte which is a congenital defect then you will get nevus depigmentosus okay so please remember if you do a biopsy of a patient who is having nevus depigmentosus the patient's biopsy specimen is going to show the melanocytes it's not like vitiligo where there is autoimmune damage to the melanocyte and there will be no melanocytes okay here the melanocytes will be there or they may be slightly reduced but they are definitely there okay uh let's go to the next question now you have look at this picture you can see this yeah you have a lesion which is present since birth when you do a dioscopy the lesion border is lost and the lesion merges into the surrounding skin so you have to tell me what is the condition whether is it nevus depigmentosus is it vitiligo is it piebaldism is it nevus anemicus so the clue that they have given you is that on dioscopy the lesion border is lost and the lesion merges to the surrounding skin yes supri you are right yes aditya you are also right 
the condition that we are looking out here is nevus anemicus now please understand that nevus anemicus has nothing to do with the pigmentary system okay so uh, nevus anemicus please remember is not a melanin disorder it looks hypopigmented the lesions look very similar to uh, nevus ane uh, achromicus or nevus depigmentosus but the basic defect is that there is abnormal vasoconstriction due to increased sensitivity of the blood vessels to catecholamines so as a result it results in a localized area of skin which causes blanching and looks apparently hypopigmented so as i said nevus anemicus and nevus depigmentosus they look very similar so if you want to differentiate between the two you can do a easy test which is dioscopy so as i mentioned earlier you just take a clean glass slide and you place it on the lesion if the lesion border is lost and the lesion merges into the surrounding skin that means it is nevus anemicus because when you apply pressure with the glass slide the surrounding normal blood vessels also get exsanguinated as a result of which the lesional border will be lost while if you do the same thing in a patient who is having nevus depigmentosus the the dias i mean the border will not change right so the lesion border is not lost and lesion will not merge into the surrounding skin correct so that's how you differentiate nevus anemicus and nevus depigmentosus using dioscopy and if you do a biopsy okay you will see that the patient will have normal melanocytes and normal melanin so as i said please remember nevus anemicus is not a melanin disorder okay it is a disorder where there is abnormal vasoconstriction because of increased sensitivity of the blood vessels to the catecholamines okay all clear can we move ahead please give me a thumbs up if there are any doubts you can interrupt me any time you can post on the chat box if there are any doubts no problem so now let's move ahead so now let's go to the next mcq you have a child which who presents with seizures okay the patient has seizures and has multiple such hypopigmented lesions on the skin since birth okay you need to tell me what will be the diagnosis that you will think of in this case will you think of vitiligo will you think of bone beals disease will you think of chidiac higashi or will you think of oculocutaneous albinism Yes Aditya you are right again the answer is bone beals disease so bone beals disease is nothing but tuberous sclerosis okay so tuberous sclerosis the other name for it is epiloia that is epilepsy ep stands for epilepsy epi stands for epilepsy then you have low iq and you have a for adenoma sebaceum the other name for this condition is bone beals disease there is basically a mutation in the tumor suppressor gene that is tsc2 more than tsc1 which is hamartin it's an autosomal dominant condition and basically you have hamartomas which occur at various sites like the skin brain kidney heart and eye yes neurocutaneous disorders yes you are very right it is tuberous sclerosis hamartomatous growths of the glial and the neuronal tissue produce potato like nodules in the cerebral cortex and hence this condition is called as tuberous sclerosis okay because there are tubers potato is a tuber correct then renal angiomyolipomas and retinal hamartomas and cardiac rhabdomyomas are the classical internal features okay now let's go to the skin manifestations of tuberous sclerosis first is the one that i showed you in the mcq that is basically an ash leaf macule now why is it called as ash leaf macule because it resembles the shape resembles the leaf of the mountain ash okay so that's why it's called as the ash leaf macule 
द टिपिकल डिस्क्रिप्शन विच इज गिवन फॉर द शेप ऑफ द मैक्यूल इज लैंड्स ओवेट सो इट्स अ लैंड्स ओवेट शेप रिजेंबलिंग द लीफ ऑफ माउंटेन एश ट्री एंड हेंस इट इज कॉल्ड एज द एश लीफ मैक्यूल Please remember that it is the first manifestation of tuberous sclerosis. That means it is the first to occur at birth. It is most common presentation which occurs in ninety percent of the patients. In certain fair-skinned individuals, it is difficult to visualize the ash leaf macula at birth. So what you can do is you can expose the entire skin to a wood lamp examination so that it becomes more prominent. Remember, if there are more than three. ash leaf macules then it is significant less than 3 you may also see it in normal people in addition there can be confetti macules confetti macules are small hypopigmented macules which are shaped like confetti okay now next very important presentation of tuberous sclerosis is adenoma sebaceum please remember again adenoma sebaceum is a misnomer it is not related to the sebaceous gland it is not an adenoma okay so adenoma sebaceum is actually an angiofibroma it presents as multiple papules which are symmetrically distributed over the cheeks nose and the forehead it is going to be seen in 75 to 90% of the patients and it is the onset is not at birth it's going to present itself at the age of 2 to 5 years okay so you may have this individually as an image based mcq multiple reddish brown colored papules which are seen on the cheeks as well as on the forehead of this child next what they have is a shagreen patch now shagreen means which is resembling shark skin so they are leathery plaques which are seen on the lumbosacral area histopathologically they are masses of collagen okay so you may get this as an mcq the they may show you this picture and they may tell you to identify what is the histopathology so histopathology is a collagenoma the onset is at the first decade of life and in addition later on at puberty they may also develop keenan's tumors basically keenan's tumors are nothing but periangual angiofibromas that you see in cases of tuberous sclerosis the other skin features that one can see include the forehead plaque skin tags and dental pits how do you treat adenoma sebaceum you treat adenoma sebaceum by uh, either you may you know shave that area or uh, i mean you know it's uh, shaving of that area shaving of the angiofibromas under anesthesia or you may do a dermabrasion or a laser the topical treatment of angiofibromas very early stages can in be topical sirolimus or topical rapamycin and uh, in the late stages one can combine the application of topical sirolimus or topical rapamycin with these invasive procedures all good everyone with me any doubts please let me know we move ahead so here you have a female patient who presents with the following lesions please look at the picture you can see that there is something wrong on the forehead out here so you need to tell me what is the diagnosis is it by baldism is it contact leucoderma is it vitiligo or is it pityriasis versicolor vishal aditya both of you are right the answer is contact leucoderma yes sachin you are also right the answer is contact leucoderma it cannot be by baldism it's not vitiligo because it is the depigmentation is very precisely conforming to the area where the patient has been applying bindi definitely doesn't fit into pityriasis versicolor the lesion is depigmented okay so the correct answer here is contact leucoderma now what is contact leucoderma it's also called as chemical leucoderma which happens because of repeated exposure to chemicals which physically destroys the melanocytes please remember that what happens in uh, cases of uh, vitiligo is that in vitiligo there is autoimmune destruction of the melanocytes okay but here there is chemical destruction of the melanocytes okay and this in this case especially it happens because of para tertiary butyl phenol now this particular chemical it's an adhesive in the sticker bindi 
okay and that causes mechanical uh, destruction physical destruction of the melanocytes as a result of which there is depigmentation which is confined to the area of application okay so the contact leucoderma is usually caused by derivatives of phenols and catechols the other very important agent which causes chemical leucoderma is monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone so this particular chemical is present on the rubber slippers leather wallets watch straps rubber gloves so it doesn't happen with one exposure it's not that one time the patient is going to apply the bindi and is going to develop depigmentation it is with repeated exposure over a long period of time that this particular chemical physically destroys the melanocytes okay so histologically if you see you cannot differentiate chemical leucoderma from vitiligo because in both these conditions there is going to be an absence of melanocytes okay but the disease process is different in melan in vitiligo it is the autoimmune destruction while in cases of chemical leucoderma it is physical destruction of or toxic uh, disruption of the melanocytes okay so i hope that's clear now let's go ahead okay now look at this patient very carefully there is this child who presents with localized white patches on the normal skin areas with white forelock okay so you have patches and these patches are having areas of normal skin okay and then you have a white forelock what is a white forelock white forelock is a like on the on the uh, on the frontal area of the scalp you can see that the hair are white okay so this is a white forelock in addition you can see there is this diamond shaped area of depigmentation on the forehead you can see that there are areas of depigmentation which are there on the entire uh, uh, chest and within those areas of depigmentation you are seeing areas of normal colored skin okay uh, so supri and manohar both of you have answered this correctly the answer is piebaldism okay now see here the patient is presenting at birth with these lesions okay so it is definitely piebaldism vitiligo congenital vitiligo is very unlikely that's the first thing second thing is in vitiligo there won't be areas of normal skin within the depigmented patch and so also white forelock is not something that you would expect at birth in vitiligo okay so it's not vitiligo it's not albinism in albinism the entire body tends to become uh, depigmented including the hair including the eyelashes and there can be involvement of the ocular uh, of the eye as a result of which even the iris can be depigmented okay so it is not albinism pku also causes lightening of the skin but then patient would have additional uh, features as well like pink staining of diapers as well as uh the the fact that it is not generalized in this case goes out of favor of phenylketonuria so pyeboldism as i said the melanocytes they are going to traverse fr uh, from the neural crest and they are going to reach the basal layer of epidermis so if the few melanocytes they forget to migrate okay then you may develop pyeboldism so it's a defect in the migration of the melanocytes from the neural crest hence there are absent melanocytes in the depigmented areas and consequently there is absent melanin okay so you have localized patches which are depigmented and typically there are some areas of normal skin which are having normal pigmentation within the white patches and they also have a white forelock so let's move ahead to the next question we have around 7 minutes before we end uh next question is a patient is born with patches of depigmented skin over the mid forehead anterior trunk mid extremities along with that he has heterochromia iridis and sensory neural hearing loss what would you expect is it piebaldism is it hermansky pudlak syndrome is it chidia khigashi syndrome or is it wardenberg syndrome anyone can come up with an answer so here you have typical piebaldism and in addition to piebaldism you have heterochromia iridis and you have sensory neural hearing loss
anyone. You cannot mark it as just piebaldism because they have specifically mentioned that in addition to the pigmentary changes, there is heterochromia iridis and sensory neuron hearing loss. Correct. So you cannot mark the answer as A. Okay. No problem. So the correct answer for this question is Wardenburg syndrome. That is option B. Okay. Now Wardenburg syndrome, remember it's an autosomal dominant disorder with piebaldism like distribution of patchy depigmentation of skin along with distinctive non-cutaneous features like heterochromia iridis, broad nasal root, dystopia cantorum that is the lateral displacement of the inner canthi and sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, so the correct answer here is D that is Waldenberg syndrome. Please remember when in addition to piebaldism, if you have heterochromia iridis, broad nasal root, dystopia cantorum and sensory neural hearing loss, the answer will be Wardenburg syndrome. Now let's go to the next. Uh, you know they have also mentioned certain other options. So let's let's discuss the rest of the options. They have mentioned hermansky pudlak syndrome and they have mentioned chediaki gashi syndrome. Now hermansky pudlak syndrome is uh, basically a rare autosomal recessive disorder which is characterized by features which are similar to oculocutaneous albinism. What is oculocutaneous albinism? The oculocutaneous albinism occurs because of uh, it occurs because of the tyrosinase gene mutation as a result of which the tyrosinase is deficient and tyrosinase as I mentioned earlier it's a very important enzyme to synthesize melanin. Okay, so that is why there will be no melanin in the skin though there will be melanocytes and that is because of the deficiency of tyrosinase. Okay, so when you have uh, depigmentation of the skin which is generalized along with depigmentation of the hair along with depigmentation of the iris then you should think of oculocutaneous albinism. But when in addition to the features of oculocutaneous albinism you have systemic involvement in the form of bleeding diathesis due to absence of dense bodies in platelets along with neutropenia, pulmonary fibrosis and granulomatous colitis you should think of hermansky pudlak syndrome. Okay, so remember oculocutaneous albinism with bleeding tendencies please think of hermansky pudlak. Okay. Let's go to the next question, next uh, option. The next option given was Shedia Khigashi. Please remember that Shedia Khigashi is again an autosomal recessive disorder. There is skin and hair depigmentation like ha that happens in uh, oculocutaneous albinism. But in addition, the patient has pyogenic infections, neurological abnormalities, mild coagulation defects. And you can demonstrate giant cytoplasmic granules in the leukocytes and platelets. And that will help you to establish the diagnosis. So please remember, if they give you in an option, oculocutaneous albinism plus bleeding tendencies, you mark hermansky pudlak If they tell you oculocutaneous albinism with multiple pyogenic infections, then you mark shidiak higashi. Okay, so please remember, that in Chidiya Kigashi, you need to demonstrate the giant cytoplasmic granules in leukocytes and platelets which will establish the diagnosis. While in cases of hermansky pudlak please remember that this bleeding happens because of the absence of dense bodies in the platelets. Okay, so now that is our last uh, question that we had to discuss. And before I end, I would like you to again, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would like you to know about the subscription, which is the iconic subscription, which comes through an academy. The iconic subscription is, you know, to get you the best of both the learning platforms, that is an academy and prep ladder. So uh, through an academy, you have live classes and batch courses and you have live tests and quizzes while through prep ladder, you have video lectures and question bank and rapid revision courses. So uh, I think when you give a get a combo and when you take it for a longer duration, the per month cost is hardly anything. 
ओके सो डू सब्सक्राइब टू दिस एंड वेन यू डू सब्सक्राइब प्लीज यूज माय कोड दैट इज डी आर रेशम टेन आई विल कीप द लास्ट वन मिनट फॉर एनी काइंड ऑफ क्वेश्चंस दैट यू मे हैव सो यू आर फ्री टू आस्क मी एनी क्वेश्चंस रिलेटेड टू द टॉपिक दैट वी हैव टेकन टुडे और अदरवाइज इज वेल you can also subscribe for the plus subscription of uh, an academy which has live classes live tests and quizzes batch courses and it has a structured schedule also very very cost effective per month okay again when you do subscribe to this do use my code that is dr resham 10 and get a 10% off so any questions anything that you would want me to ask if not then we can conclude the session here thank you very much everyone for a patient listening and actively participating in the polls so with that i would like to end my uh, lecture today thank you very much bye thank you vishal bye yeah yeah